pasta and gelato filled Italian dream. <laughs> Today, my guest is Casey Rose. She has amassed an insane number of followers on social media, 1,500,000 in total, and has recently published a book called You Deserve Good Gelato, which tracks her life story. So welcome, Casey. I'm excited to have you on the show. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to chat. <laughs> Can you tell I'm just waiting? I'm like, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I love that your energy on social media and your energy in real life is exactly the same. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> it's because I have no filter. That's why. <laughs> and as oh, I told you, and as I've told you before, you know, we started uh, filming, I said, like, this is what people actually mm -hmm. really need. Uh, we've had enough of the filtered reality mm -hmm. on Instagram. We need some more real creators like you. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's very sweet. So I'd love to hear your life story, obviously. I mean, uh, I, I've read up on it. I know why you moved back to Italy, but I'd love to hear it from you. Tell us. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of all started in 2018. Um, I was a professional dancer in New York, just to give you like a little summary moment. Um, I was a professional dancer in New York um, and I was, I was at a place where I was just not super happy with what was happening uh, in my life. It, you know, that industry is very complicated. It's very difficult. Um, and so kind of on a whim, I, I booked a, I booked a solo trip to Italy. I had always felt like I wanted to go. I kept waiting for somebody to go with, and then years went by and I was still waiting and I decided one day, fuck it, I'm going to do it. So I did. Yeah. And then on that solo trip, I did Venice, Florence and Rome. And on my first day in Florence, I met Dario, my boyfriend. Um, we did long distance for a year, kind of a summary, long distance for a year. Then he came to live with me in New York for a year. And then in January, 2021, we moved back to Italy together and it was on a six month trial basis. And here we are three years later, just never left. <laughs> okay. 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 Rewind. Oh. You met Dario on the <laughs> first day. Yeah. Yeah. First day in Florence, first day in Florence. I had spent uh, two days in Venice before that and then three days in Florence. And then I did four days in Rome after that. But first day in Florence. Yeah. Yeah. I went to a jazz club. Uh, it's called Jazz Club Firenze. If anybody is in Florence and wants to check it out, it's really cool. It's like an underground spot. Um, I went just because I, I, a friend who had studied abroad told me to go and he was there. That's, that's literally it. I wish it was more than that, but no, he was there. He was sitting across the room and we kind of clocked eyes as I came in. I was like, he's kind of cute, but I'm not going to say anything. Cause I was, you know, I was solo. I was like, I did this solo trip basically to like do things that scared me and kind of challenge myself. Um, so I was like, I'm going to go to this jazz club. I'm going to just be for there for one song. I'll suss it out, suss out the vibe. And if I don't like it, I can always leave. Um, and I went, stood in the back, clocked eyes. He came over after like 10 minutes, said, ciao. I said, ciao. I said, that's all the Italian I got for you. He said, that's you. It's okay. We can speak in English and the rest is history. What a story. I've been yeah. to Italy so many times. Yeah. And all I've gotten, me. well, I've been all over, to be honest. I've gone to uh, Naples. I've gone even to the south, oh. to Calabria. And nice. Nice. I guess, you know, at the back of your mind, when you travel to Italy, you're always waiting for that story because we've been fed these stories, you know, like I these know. movies. I mean, even uh, lately, there was a wonderful series. I don't know if you watched that. I'm sure you have. It's called From Scratch. So many people, you know, I haven't watched it. I haven't watched it yet because so many people keep telling me they're like, it's so similar to your story. And I'm like, I feel like it would be a little weird to like watch it. Yeah. Um, I, still, I still have to watch it. Yeah. I, I, I definitely it. hope it's not similar to your story because it has a really tragic ending. <laughs> I've heard that too. People are like, it's, it's just like you. And I'm like, God, I hope not. Like, <laughs> yeah. The guy gets terminal cancer, not to be a spoiler <laughs> alert here, but I don't, I hope that's not your story. Uh, but yeah, the beginning is basically like, that is where the girl goes to exactly American girls goes to Italy meets an Italian guy and that's an insane story that's something you read about literally in a book and you don't think that's ever going to happen to you and it happened yeah to you. yeah you know it's funny because when I booked the solo trip I did it for me and me alone and I still stand by I stand by completely that you do not need a romantic relationship when you're traveling in order to make it fulfilling like it is an added bonus if it happens but it's not necessary at all to have a fulfilling trip um but yeah, my friends had joked with me like, oh, you're going to meet an Italian guy and you're going to fall in love. And that's the last we're ever going to see of you. And I was like, ha ha ha. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I walked back. I came back with my tail between my legs. and I was like, so I met a guy. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And then you moved back to the US. And I mean, I, I'm assuming Dario was a huge part of the reason that you moved back to Italy. But was there something else that drove you to leave the US? Yeah, I mean, you know, 2020 was was tragic for a lot of reasons that I don't think I need to go into. But um, there was also a lot of silver linings. And one of my silver linings during that whole time period was the fact that I was able to come to the realization that maybe I wasn't happy doing what I was doing, going back to performing and going back to, you know, the performing industry and all that. I was at a point before COVID where I hated the industry so much that I started to hate dance itself. And I don't want to hate dance because that's a big part of my life, but it had gotten to a point where I just was so unhappy. I was having frequent anxiety attacks. I was feeling stuck. I was working like three, four jobs just to like get by. Like it was, I was in a really um, not healthy place to be. Um, and so when COVID happened and my entire industry shut down and everything completely stopped, I was for, I could not do it even if I wanted to. Uh, and instead of feeling upset about that, I was relieved. And I was like, Ooh, that's something that I should probably pay attention to. If I'm feeling relieved that I don't have to go to auditions, that I don't have to go to dance class, that I don't have to like post online, like that's something I should probably listen to. Um, and so all the rest of that year was me coming to that realization. And then, you know, at the end of Dario's visa, which his visa was up in, in December, 2020, um, it was kind of like my industry wasn't opening anytime soon. And it was another one of those moments where we had this opportunity to move to Italy because Italy was still accepting study visas. And it was one of those moments where it was like, this terrifies me, but I'm going to regret it if I don't do it. So we moved. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. <clears throat> I was listening recently to a podcast and they said like, whenever, you know, you have a major decision in front of you, the reason you know that it's, a, a good decision to make, or let, let's say that that it's the right uh, choice to make, is that you kind of feel yourself expanding, even though something terrifies you. You feel kind of like a sense of possibility. Yeah. Whereas yeah. A, a bad decision or something that's not in tr in line with what you want, you kind of feel yourself like shrinking. Like you, you're just you're not excited yeah. about it. That's the difference. Yeah. A friend once told me, if it's a yes in your body, then it's a yes in real life, and I couldn't agree with her more. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I'm a strong believer in that if you do something that truly aligns with who you are, everything kind of falls into place eventually, at least. Yeah. But if Absolutely. you go against yourself, it's just uh, it's just never going to work. That's the way it's yeah. been for me, at least. Mm -hmm. No, me too. Absolutely. It's like if you had told me five years ago that I would, would be doing this, I'd be sitting here with you, um, I would have thought you were out of your mind. There is just no way. But because like, I don't know, it's just about grabbing life and about, you know, grabbing all the opportunities that life is just waiting to give to you. You just have to be brave enough to take them, you know? Yeah. And I think so many people there out there are fearful uh, about making that big move because it is scary. And, and thankfully mm -hmm. you had Dario, you had kind of, yeah. I think another reason to, to move to Italy. Mm -hmm. Would you have done it if you mm -hmm. hadn't met him? Do you think? I, you know, I don't even want to say if I hadn't met him, but I, Yes and no, because I, I, I've always been interested about what life would be like abroad. But I think the thing that was keeping me very chained in my comfort zone was this fear of change, this fear of doing something different. And when I, you know, honestly, again, COVID was the kind of the thing that started changing that for me. And it was one of those things that, especially with my performance career, which was something that I had built up in my mind since I was a little girl, like since I was three years old, I was dancing and I was going to be on Broadway. I'm going to be a professional dancer. Like that's what I'm going to do. And I don't know if I, I think I needed something to, to stop me, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know if I would have been able to pull myself out of it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's a tricky question to answer. That's a tricky Yeah, question. I guess I guess if everything was going smoothly the way it had in the past, you would have had less of an incentive to to change something, mm -hmm. right? Because I think mm -hmm. we change something where we feel like really stuck. Like, okay, this is not going anywhere. I'm not happy about this. Like, I'm really I'm not happy. So this yeah. is when I, I change something. But before that, when people are kind of in the middle, kind of in mm -hmm. that gray zone, it's easy just to stay in it, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just like, again, it's your comfort zone, right? Like you stay changing your comfort zone. We stay changing our routines for a reason. It's because they're safe and nothing bad happens when we're changing our comfort zones. And I think 
a big thing for me was, was, even like booking my solo trip was just getting out of my comfort zone. And that's a really scary thing to do. And it's about doing the shit that scares you because life is just too short not to. And the whole reason why I made that first leap. And then from that moment of my solo trip, why it was not easier, but I had um, not more incentive. I don't even know the right word for it, honestly, but the reason why I was able from that point on to keep doing these scary things and keep making these scary, you know, jumps, um, is because I thought of if I was, if I'm on my deathbed and I'm looking back and I'm regretting not doing things just because I was too scared to do them. Like that to me is 10 times scarier than just doing the scary thing. Like that's not good enough for me and it's not good enough for you. It's not good enough for anybody. Like we don't get a do over at the end of our life. Like that is it. We have an expiration date. And if we are looking back and regretting not doing something because we're too scared to do it, like that's scarier to me than just doing the scary thing. And I think coming to that realization um, has helped me make a lot of choices that I'm so grateful to, to be making um, that I don't know if I would have made before kind of coming to that realization, you know? Yes, 100%. I think we have to choose the kind of dif discomfort we want. Is it discomfort mm -hmm. now or is it discomfort later when you realize you've been yeah. going completely off the, your own path, yeah. right? And then you have to yeah. live with that. And it's much harder to reverse the course later. I think it's still possible for anybody that wants to do it. But yeah, I think that's very interesting for me that, um, and, you know, and this is something I wasn't going to talk about prior to the podcast. I was just going to talk yeah. about culture shock and, you know, living yeah. in Italy. But for me, it's interesting to hear stories like this where you're just like, I took my first solo trip and then I was like, you know what? I did that. I was capable of doing that. Let me do the next step. I'm capable of yeah. something more now, right? It's like yeah. you, you started already. So if you can do one thing, you can you can do the rest, basically. Well, you start to realize that you're so much more capable than you think you are, right? And I think like that's kind of, you know, where my mindset is and kind of why I started doing what I'm doing now because I just genuinely believe that we are all so much more capable than we think we are. It's just we have to be brave enough to take that first step and we have to be brave enough to do things that scare us. So you yeah. arrived to Italy, you live in Florence yeah. and let's talk about culture shocks. I love hearing <laughs> culture shocks. So my, my girl, obsession. let's do it. <laughs> Lay it on me. I'm ready. <laughs> So I've obviously stalked your Instagram. I don't know if stalking is the right word as it's open to the, okay, to the public, but you know, I've gone, I've gone through it and yeah, obviously a lot of it is on culture shocks and things you have to know when you're, you're living in Italy, but what were like the major ones that really surprised you as an American? Mm. You know, it's so funny because I get this question all the time and it's usually like, what's the biggest culture shock? And it's to me, I think the thing, you know, that I realized when it's, it's not even the big ones, like the language or anything like that. It's the small culture shocks that you would never think to like Google or ask somebody or like you would never think is different. Like they're not things that would cross your mind. Right. And so mm -hmm. all those were the things that were the biggest to me. So things like, for example, um, when we landed in Italy, there was a two week mandatory quarantine. So we were inside for two weeks. Um, and then when our two week quarantine was up, it was Dario's birthday. And so I walked my, I was like, I'm going to like give a big surprise. I'm going to decorate the apartment. Like I'm going full out. Right. And I had no idea where to go to get any of this stuff, but there was a pharmacy across the street. So I was like, great. A pharmacy in my head. I'm thinking <laughs> CVS, Dwayne Reed, like, you know, like our pharmacies in the U S are basically like little mini markets. Right. Um, and so it just didn't cross my mind. I was like, yeah, a pharmacy, they'll have birthday cards. <laughs> didn't cross my mind. And so I walked in and I did a lap and it was all the normal things you'd find in a pharmacy, like medicine and, and high-end skincare and stuff. And I didn't see any, any, any birthday cards. So I, I, <laughs> I marched my booty up right to the pharmacist and I was like <laughs> typing in Google Translate because I didn't know any Italian at that point. And I flipped the camera. It was like, where are the birth or like, do you have birthday cards? And the way she looked at me, I swear, I was like, I think I grew three heads because the way she looked at me, she was like, Quese una farmacia. Like she, and I didn't need Google Translate for that one. I was like, cool. Um, <laughs> and so I like, I went home. I didn't know where to get a birthday card. 
Um, so I went home and I, and I scribbled on like a, a scrap piece of notebook paper. And that was his birthday card for the year because I didn't know where I was supposed to go. Um, and they're called Cateria, by the way. There's like specific stores for, for birthday cards and gift supplies. But I didn't, again, I didn't know. Um, or like things like going to the grocery store, like in the U.S. or most parts of the U.S., because I think down in Texas they do this. But in most parts of the U.S. where I grew up, you your fruit and your vegetables, you bag them yourself, but they weigh them at the cashier, right? Not in Italy. No, no, no. In Italy, you have to weigh them before you get to the to the cashier and print out like a little price sticker. And then you take them up to the cashier. Again, I didn't know this. So I took all my fruits and veggies and I walked up to the cashier and I put them down and none of them had price stickers. So I had to basically do like the walk of shame, like gather them all back up and like walk past the line of Italians who were like, why doesn't, why didn't she get a sticker and it's just like it's little things like that where it's just like you wouldn't you didn't you don't know you don't know because they're not something they're so small and seemingly insignificant that you would never think that they would be like you know big culture shocks you yeah know? Th those are great examples because I mean, obviously, with the with the first example, Americans drug drug store is just the name for it. In Canada, we have something similar, but you have basically everything there. You have toys, you have chocolate, you have yeah, and, pet supplies, and baby supplies. supplies, yeah, everything, yeah, everything. And everything. in in Italy, and I mean, in I think all of Europe, actually, I would say, I'm not sure if it's lot, all of yeah. Europe, but definitely like Portugal, uh, Spain, uh, no, yeah, no, minus I, I the like, UK. Minus the UK, they definitely, mm -hmm. it's it's just a pharmacy, but you have pharmacies like on mm -hmm. every corner, right? <clears throat> yeah, a pharmacy, yeah. But then there's the other thing, like, gosh, the other one in Italy, like they closed down for three hours in the middle of the day. And that was very bizarre too, when I like needed medicine and I went at 1.30 and it was like, no, we're at lunch. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. you know? It's it's super interesting listening to these. I've definitely had the mm -hmm. the incident with not weighing the fruits and vegetables as well. And I'm trying yeah. as we're talking, I'm trying to remember where was that? It might have been in Italy, you're right. Or somewhere else in Europe where you have to do it yourself and then they're kind of like they kind of like look at you like you're an complete idiot. Like how could you not know that you had to do this and then you have to go oh, back and do it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like literally like it's the equivalent of like a walk of shame. I'm like, I am so embarrassed. <laughs> but it's okay. Exactly. Exactly. It is what it is. It's a learning experience, you know? You know what? what's interesting? When, when I was in Florence, I, I remember, the, the, I guess for me, <laughs> Italians are going to hate me for this. But for me, it's still very difficult to, to come to terms with very small coffees because <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> When I was yeah. when I was in Italy, I was working, I was teaching English online. And when you're doing that, you need like a big cup of coffee to get you through the four mm -hmm. hours of teaching. And I remember I really wanted a coffee. And I went to the, you know, to well, obviously to get coffee in Italy. And the coffees are very small in size, which is they're yeah. the way better coffee than the than in the US. Of course. But it's really small for me. And at one point I really wanted a tea. And the woman didn't know what to do mm. with me because tea is not very oh. common. <laughs> Not really. No, not in bars. I mean, they have it, but it's not. Yeah, it's very rare to find an Italian like going to a bar to drink a tea. You know, it's exactly. mostly coffee. Yeah. yeah and yeah, the way yeah. she looked it's... at me, she looked at me like I was a traitor to the entire country. <laughs> How could you order a tea? And then she plopped this like bag, this tea bag, put some water, <laughs> not even enough water. <laughs> it's like a dusty tea bag that's like on the back shelf. She's like, this is all we got. <laughs> Exactly. I'm sure like probably trying so hard to accommodate you, but just like, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. These are great. These are great. Yeah. Do you have any others that were, no. when it comes to Italians and mm -hmm. um, either communication styles or mannerisms or anything like that, was it at all? I mean, was it very different from the, from Americans? Oh my gosh, it's night and day. It's two completely different cultures, right? Like two completely different set of norms, two completely different traditions, two completely different just like ways of life. So there are so many differences, especially like, gosh, like I don't even like staring, for example, like let's start with that. Like staring is so normal in, in Italian culture. And I guess like at least again, where I grew up in the US because the US is so big, Canada, I'm sure is the same. At least where I grew up in the U.S. and in American culture, like staring is really rude. Like you're, you're not supposed to stare. But I remember probably one of the first times we went out, 
<laughs> I was with Dario. And again, like my, I didn't really speak Italian that well. And <laughs> this, this older man just stopped on the street and just stared and like looked me up and down and was just openly staring. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And eventually he asked, he's like, how tall are you? And Dario was like, oh, she's, you know, this height. And then that's all he, and then he left. But it was like a full five minutes of just this interaction. And it's just, yeah, it's things like that in terms of communication style. Um, it varies depending on Italy, but, so, you know, it, it's very honest and very blunt and very coming from an American culture where we're very smiley and very polite. Try not to I offend from, as well, right? Try not, try to, not to offend. Yes, yeah. just very like polite. And I hear that from Italians a lot where they're just like, you guys smile so much and you're just like, you are very smiley. Um, but coming into Italy where maybe that's not necessarily the case, Italians are very kind, they're very polite, but definitely not in the same way as Americans are. And so kind of the first couple of months I was here, I had to wrap my head around that and be like, okay, this is just a different way of being polite. Let's, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you mentioned the staring because as soon as you mm -hmm. said that, I remember it just taking the Metro and people openly looking you up and down. <laughs> and I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm from Canada. Like when you're talking about being polite and not staring, for yeah. sure. Never. You take it to the next level. you Canadians. I love exactly. you. <laughs> exactly. But I'm originally Russian. So I'm very much okay. aware of the directness, you know, and like, yep. it's a very direct country. So I'm touring right in yeah. the middle. But I think you're very yeah. right when you say that there's less of a filter to conversations as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Recently, we went out for dinner with a friend of mine and there was an Italian guy there. And he just went, he was just like, uh, how old are you to her? And she just was like, I, I don't want to answer that. He's like, oh, but come on, but how old are you? And he just kept on pressing her and pressing her. And I kept on thinking, wow, Italians can be very direct, actually. Very direct, very direct. No filter is a really good way to put it. And it's not, again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just very much a difference in culture. Kind of what you said, like it, in American culture and Canadian culture and Russian culture, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but you you don't ask a woman her age, right? Like you just don't do that. But that's maybe not the case here. It's just two different, it's just two different cultures. And it can be really tricky in that way, right? To like, it's so normal to misinterpret something as rude um, when it's not rude in that culture. It's just the way that culture is. It's not seen as rude, but it's seen as rude in the other culture. And it can get really tricky with like miscommunications, right? I'm thinking of like, when Dario and I first started dating in Midwest American culture, where I am from, where I grew up, and this is very, again, I'm going to repeat myself for the thousandth time just to like really drive it home, but it's so different than the rest of the US, but where I grew up, um, a very like normal and acceptable answer to somebody who says, uh, thank you. Like if you did a service for them, thank you. A really normal like, answer is like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, or no worries. Sure. Four completely normal answers. And it's meant to indicate that like what you asked me to do was not an inconvenience. So the thank you is not necessary. Like it's just a way to be like, you don't need to thank me. But in Italian culture and many other cultures, even in the US, it is rude. And so when Dario and I first started dating and he'd be like, thank you, I'd be like, mm-hmm. And it started to bother him. And eventually he was like, are you mad at me or something? Like, why are you mad at me? Um, and we had to sit down and I was like, I'm not, of course I'm not mad at you. What are you talking about? And we had to like sit down and talk about it and be like, this is not rude in my culture. Like, and he, you know, he understands now and it came, it ended up fine, but it was definitely like a miscommunication that if we didn't sit down and talk about it, um, it would have been interpreted very, very differently. Yeah. And there's a lot of those. Yeah, I really, I would love to hear more of these examples. And I, and I love that you preface that with, by the way, saying Midwest is very different uh, because yeah. we have these conversations come up a lot where someone will talk about a specific part of the US and then all the other Americans will chip in and say, well, it's not the way it is in Texas or, yeah. you know, Ohio. Yeah. And so yeah. <clears throat> that's that's a nice way to preface it. And as well, how, how interesting it is to have two cultures and the way you kind of interpret each other and then mm -hmm. to to talk about it and to 
I think the important thing is to communicate it, right? Because he comes into the relationship with his set of expectations and you come into the relationship with yours and it's two cultures mm -hmm. clashing and you might not even know it. You might you yeah. might say, oh, well, he's just rude or he's just whatever, X, 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 you know? You have to take things with a grain of salt and like maybe understand that it's a miscommunication on a cultural level, on a language level, on an everything level, right? Um, another one that was another big thing, kind of similar to my, mm -hmm, was in, so in Italian, there's like a command form. It's, it's senti, which means listen. And it's not, um, in Italian, it's, it's almost like a connective tissue. Like it, it indicates like, Hey, there's this really cool thing that I want to tell you. And like, just to really get your attention, I'm going to say senti so that like your ears perk up and you know that what I'm telling you is important, right? It's not like a listen. It's more just like a, hey, 